Iceland, midway between the old world and the new world, a link between the two halves of the 15-nation Atlantic community. 300 miles across, this ocean island on the edge of the Arctic Circle stands much as it was when the first Viking settlers arrived from Norway in the 9th and 10th centuries. Covering most of the interior are the same volcanic peaks and lava valleys, bubbling sulfur pools and glaciers. In summer, a strange and beautiful land, but in winter, a desert of wind and ice. Immense waterfalls, among Europe's greatest, could provide almost unlimited power. But these, together with fields of underground volcanic steam jets, represent almost the only natural resources on the island. Icelanders have skillfully harnessed this potential energy. They drill for the steam and pipe it off. And the mountain rivers provide power through extensive hydroelectric installations. These services bring cheap heat and energy to the nation's homes and villages, though in some places nature competes with free deliveries. Home comforts also include unlimited and permanent hot water supplies, with enough over to feed extensive hothouse farms. Only here can Icelanders grow the fruit and flowers that must otherwise be shipped in from temperate climates. Only about a fifth of the island's surface is lowland, but this is sufficient for a dairy industry that supplies the entire country. Most of the farm produce is handled by highly developed cooperative societies whose members include at least half the families in Iceland. In this country, larger than Ireland, or the state of Maine, live only 150,000 people. Yet with a slow increase of population, fresh land must be broken to establish new farms. After draining an area of marshland, soil experts move in to evaluate the reclaimed acres and to advise on the most suitable crops. Machinery is essential on Icelandic farms to make full use of the short, good weather months. And as the harvest is a matter of national interest, it's the custom for students and other young people to leave the town in summer and to help bring in crops and fodder. Even the mountains contribute their share. Hay is brought down from the highland summer pastures, usually loaded on hardy Icelandic ponies. Accustomed to living in mountain country and often in deep snow, these strong little animals were once an important source of income. Even today, many are still exported after the yearly roundup.
same open range farming method is used to raise sheep. The flocks graze freely throughout the summer until the September roundup. And as air transportation is a routine affair in Iceland, mutton on the hoof becomes airborne on its way from isolated farms to the main marketing centers. The wool is absorbed by a modern domestic textile industry that satisfies national needs in wool cloth. Finished goods go on sale in the stores and shop windows of towns and villages and in the nation's capital, Reykjavik, where over one-third of Iceland's people make their home. Reykjavik stands on the site of the original 9th century Viking settlement. Today, it is a modern center of Atlantic industry and trade. Set on the coastal plain, like most Icelandic communities, the capital is linked with cities around the island by one of the world's most highly developed systems of internal airlines. Icelanders take planes rather as others catch a bus to start a new term in college for the big twice yearly shopping trips or for the young at heart, a spree in the capital. While taking the air age in their stride, Icelanders must still master the seas, for the ocean is more than a highway for the nation's trade and commerce. It is, above all, the home of the vital fishing industry, the basis of Iceland's economy and a living for at least half her people. Work begins on the decks of large deep sea trawlers that reach far into the Arctic and the White Sea for the raw material of this major food industry one billion pounds of fish every year. As important as the efforts of this far-ranging fleet are the hundreds of smaller offshore vessels based on coastal towns and villages. Big or small, the job is to bring in the catch for export. It may be herring, salted the old way, or cod dried in the sun as the Vikings did it. Most of the cod caught today goes through one of the many modern drying chambers heated by natural volcanic steam. In recent years, however, the adoption of quick freezing has extended the sale of fresh Icelandic fish to the housewives of three continents. To serve this wealth in the seas about Iceland, an entire government department is charged with the long-term planning and development of the fishing industries. For on this single activity depends not only Iceland's economic future, but also her present high living standards. Good living begins with the youngest Icelanders. They get a start in life that few nations can equal. Sport and recreation are important, and a swimming certificate is a must for leaving school. Quite often, the site of a new schoolhouse is decided by the location of a natural hot spring that can feed the swimming pool. Standards of social welfare are among the highest in the world, with emphasis on child care. And as the sun vanishes during much of the Arctic winter, children get their sunshine the artificial way. 
during school hours and as part of a careful check on physical development. And in the land that cod liver oil comes from, the daily dose is quite inescapable. could be any of the Scandinavian tongues that are compulsory study for every school child. Although Iceland is far from its nearest neighbors, languages and knowledge can help overcome this isolation. On average, Icelanders hold the world record in the buying and reading of books. Magnificent national libraries offer unlimited reading in many languages. And as their own tongue has changed little since Viking times, Icelanders read the sagas of the 10th century as easily as today's newspaper. Some of the earliest Icelandic writings refer to the Althing, Iceland's Republican Parliament, the oldest democratic assembly in the world. In 1949, the Althing voted for Icelandic membership of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, a brave decision for a small country placed strategically midway between New York and Moscow. With such a limited population, Icelanders maintain no armed services, and the only locally organized body is the island's unarmed police force. Defense is assured by a small NATO base and by the guarantee of immediate and adequate aid by 14 friendly powers if national independence is ever threatened. That national independence is highly valued. Almost every citizen turns out to celebrate the anniversary of the day in 1944 when Iceland finally separated from Denmark and regained full self-government. The 17th of June is a day when Iceland enjoys 20 hours of sunshine and dancing continues through the night. Though at four in the morning, not everyone is celebrating. On duty are teams of expert weather forecasters who keep day and night watch around the year, plotting and calculating the probable climatic conditions over wide expanses of the North Atlantic. This information, valuable to farmers, fishermen, and ocean shipping, and vital to the 100 aircraft now crossing the Atlantic every 48 hours, is broadcast by Iceland Air Radio at Kafunas over 11 different wavelengths. Another guarantee for safe operation of the air routes that closely bind the 15 NATO countries. For although Iceland's nearest NATO neighbors are 500 miles away, the island is closer than any of them to the two separate halves of the Atlantic community. By air as near to Norway, to Denmark, and to the United Kingdom, as she is to the United States of America, to Canada, and to Denmark's Greenland. Iceland's role then is a crucial one within the Atlantic community. A halfway house linking the old world with the new. But in her thousandth year, Iceland is more than an advanced post in the air age of the 20th century. This Atlantic island nation is a monument to the moral courage of free men. By their determination and in their faith, they have created a prosperous and a just society upon one of the most unpromising lands on earth.